This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. I mean, I, I kind of knew that I had a good ear from a very young age. So I, I recall my, my sister was learning the piano and um, she wasn't that good. And uh, I, my mother was in our kitchen and all of a sudden she heard my sister's pieces that she was practicing being played very well. And she walked into the living room and lo and behold, it was me playing the songs that my sister had been playing terribly for months on end. And then I just learned them by ear and uh, was playing them on the piano. So she quickly swapped me into being the one that was getting the piano lessons <laughs> instead of my sister. And, uh, you know, it felt good to have that kind of recognition at that age. I was about five or six years old, I think. And, um, you know, I was told that I was gifted and I, I had a good ear for music. So that just kind of started my journey, you know. And from there, um, I, I, I joined choirs. I played the violin. I played drum. I just music was kind of a thing that was a big part of my life, um, you know, for, from, from then on really and and in terms of learning the piano did you learn um you know with a teacher classical stuff did you learn re to read and, and is that how you made your start that in that way i did i did I, I had a remarkable um classical teacher called william lowe and uh he taught me for many many years um through the ame b grading system which we have uh here in australia um, which, you know, in hindsight, I, it was good to do, but I, I, I don't know if I'd do that again if I was learning music per se, because cause it, it, um, it, was, it was tough, <laughs> you know. There wasn't always a lot of love for the music in doing that uh, methodology. Uh, mm. it, was always, it was always a, a challenge and, um, and you'd have to perform a bunch of pieces at the end of, a, of, of the year, you had a whole year to learn some songs. Oh, my God. And mm -hmm. at, at the end, you'd have to perform them to one examiner in a room and he'd give you a mark at how well you played them. Um, you know, and that, that to me now seems a bit ridiculous, really. But, you know, yeah. it, it, it turned out that it, it gave me technical ability and, and some, some skills. But to be honest, I would have much rather gained those things through passion and drive than through the way that I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a difficult one, though, because would you have had, do you reckon you'd have had the passion and drive to get those skills without that type of, I don't know, that, that kind of formal environment is, is kind of painful as it is. It seems like it's this like kind of pain worth going through. I mean, how many grades are there? Is it the same as in the UK, like eight grades? Eight grades, then you've got licentious and one other. So there's like 10 grades. Um, and how many years up. did it take to get uh, to do the grade? I think I, I went to, it, it, it's one year to do a grade. Yeah. Just do a, a, a grade a year. And I got to grade six or seven and then I stopped because I just said, I want to break from music. It drove yeah. me a little bit nuts and I, was, I wasn't really playing any popular music. It was all very classical music. And you know, the, the, the other thing that I found in frust uh, frustrating in hindsight is um, the repertoire that you're playing is predominantly music that is written for those grades. So, you know, the, the mere fact that the passion isn't even there in the music, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. It's, it's written for a specific thing. And so, and you, it, you know, inevitably you can kind of feel that maybe you don't realize it but as a kid it's like you're playing this song and it's just got no oomph, you know and that's 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 what i found sometimes challenging maybe there's i'm, I'm completely wrong maybe something no, wrong, but that's I mean, that's I that's think, the experience that i went through 
I think, I think you're, uh, you're speaking for a lot. I think of the, 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 the bottom line is it's, it's very difficult to teach children how to play music and to uh, keep them passionate and interested. I think if, you know, well, as, as incredible as my teacher. Is... Yes. And, and what you know, do you recommend I, I, popular I have... music though? Like, I, or like with, I don't know, because you, you must have enjoyed some pop, pop stuff or it doesn't even need to be like really disposable pop. It could like it's, just something yeah. a bit more funky. Well, it's, it's different. There's, there's different things that you have to learn with that kind of music. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot bigger emphasis, depending on what you're talking about with pop music, but there's, there's definitely a much larger emphasis on composition and there's a much larger emphasis on rhythm. And, and those things aren't really paid. You, you don't really pay too much attention with that kind of stuff in classical music. You kind of just read and try and be as emotional as you can be with the score that's in front of you and memorize that, you know, without having that, you know, me, me going to university and, and, and studying jazz and popular music, I, I had to relearn how I approached music in, in, the, in, in the practice sense because I, I didn't have an understanding of time because that wasn't really taught to me with my classical method. I think if you get to a very, very high level of classical training, then you, you probably do look at that kind of stuff. But for me, it, it just wasn't a thing that I, that, that I learned. So all of a sudden I had to have an understanding of pocket and, and subdivision and time and polyrhythms and all this kind of stuff that I was quite foreign to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think there are so many people that would be experiencing the same thing with regards to music education. Like it's a very, it is very mm. stuffy. That's uh, doing the grades and there's very little room for any enjoyment and it is yes. just quite a stifling thing. But during that time, were you getting into music by other artists? Was there music that you were enjoying as a fan that made you think that you might want to pursue music professionally or, or you know, that was really instilling in you that sense of passion? Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, it was quite separate to the rest of my life. If, if, if that makes sense, like the way that I was learning piano and, and music was, you know, I, I was in the National Boys Choir, which was similar in the sense that it, it, it you know, a lot of the repertoire was classical repertoire. So I, I had this connection with classical music that I wasn't heaps interested in or passionate about, but I was kind of in it because I was good at it, you know. And, and that, that, that continued for many, many years into my teenage years until I was probably 16 or 17 when I just sort of went, stop, I'm not doing this anymore because I don't love it. And, and then I found sort of more popular music at that time. I would have been listening to a lot more. Um, I, I was, I mean, in, in that time, it was this, we, we're, we're talking 90s now. So I, I was listening to whatever was on the radio then, like Smashing Pumpkins, Chili Peppers back when they were doing good shit, like um, Elliot Smith. I was into uh, like folk music, like Nick Drake, listening to Dylan. I was just like, I was kind of on those tips. And I was, also, I was also getting into more jazz, like traditional jazz pianists too, like Earl Hines and Fats Waller. I was listening to that kind of, because it still had this classical inflection in the way that they played, but there was a, a, a certain virtuosity that came from the, their, their classical uh, learn, learning, but uh, it was, there was this expression through improvisation that, that really um, struck me. And Dave Brubeck, he was one of the first dudes that I, I listened to a lot because he had a real melodic uh, improvisation approach that, that really caught my ear. And, and what made you decide to go to uni to study it? Um, because I wasn't really doing anything else, you know, and I, I, I just, it was, you know, fuck, you're going to go list, learn music at a, at a school full time. <laughs> it sounds amazing, dude. So I was like all about it back then. It was, and it, it was, it was a great time. I was playing music with people every day, studying you know, music, studying ethnomusicology, studying theory. It was the school that I went to was, was quite broad in its study. So it was really nice 
to have a, a large palette of things to learn um, and kind of, you know, choose after what, what, what I was really interested in. And in terms of, uh, you know, starting the band, starting Aetis Coyote, like, yes. how did you meet? How did you meet the others? Uh, I mean, for, for the first time I met them all in the rehearsal room. I, um, I didn't know Nay. I was actually living with Perrin for six months before we played together. He moved into the share house that I was living in. We were living in a, a big old share house, probably about five or six musicians living in it. And there were p people coming in and out all the time living there. And he, he moved in. And at, at the time I was playing in many, many bands in Melbourne. I was probably playing about six or seven projects. So playing lots and lots of gigs. So I didn't really see him that much. I wasn't really home a lot. But um, the bass player, Paul, he, we, we did a wedding gig together and he said, man, I've got this band that we've just kind of started and it's really good and I need a keyboard player. Can you suggest anybody? And I, and I was like, man, I'll, I'll do it. Let's give it a crack. And, and he was like, really? Oh, wow, okay. Because he just didn't think I would have time to do it. But, you know, I was interested. So we, we jumped in the room and... And yeah, I think they they they'd been sort of trying out a few different members. They had a couple of rehearsals with some different musicians, and nothing really clicked. And then when the four of us played together, it was um, it was pretty good. It was pretty magical. You know, we had a really nice connection. There was a nice understanding of each other, and there was generally smiles all round. You know, at that first rehearsal, so we just kept playing together. How and often were you playing on, together at the start? Like, did you think that this was going to be a serious thing that would come to, you know, be really important to you? No, but it was very exciting at the time. And I think it was just the circumstance. Like, Bender was actually living on the other side of town, but he had, he has a combi van, like a, an old Volkswagen combi. And he used to just come over. He, would, he basically lived at our place he was just there all the time. He just moved in and slept in his combi. And and we played every single day. I pretty much pretty much every day for about eight or nine months. Nice. Me, Bender and Perrin were playing and whenever Nay Nay lived about ten minutes away. So she would come over whenever she could. But because me and Bender were living at this place, we we had an old shop front that we converted into a, a recording studio. In a rehearsal room so we had that set up and we just played all the time it was just constant constant jamming and the other thing was the, it, the, the space was a hub as well so there was there was always 10 to 15 musicians just in the house you know you get home from a gig at two in the morning there'd be 10 musos there because everyone had finished their gigs and they could come back to our place you know so it was that kind of environment where there was a lot of creativity and everyone had their own little studios in their bedrooms and it was just music getting made all the time. You know, there was a metal guy living in one room. There was a, there was a trumpet player living in the other one. There was, you know, and then me with all my keyboards and I think there was two drummers living at the house. It, it, there was just fucking music 24 <laughs> seven, you know? Sounds like an amazing great. environment. Yeah. Uh, it was a really good time, yeah. Is, is that where you recorded Talk Tomahawk? It is. And uh, when you put that out there, like, was that completely independent? There was no record label involved? and you know, how Initially, it, yes. How did it find its, uh, it, its voice? Was it just literally, I mean, presumably just the sheer quality of it, really? So just we just put it out on out. Bandcamp. And then there was a couple of key things that pushed it into its existence in, or being recognised in the United States to begin with. We, we supported Taylor McFerrin at a show in Melbourne and it was the first time he heard us play and, and he was kind of blown away. It was a pretty funny gig. There was no one there. There was probably about four or five people in the room. It was at a place <laughs> called the Esplanade Hotel in St Kilda and... Uh, we just got the support for him for some reason. And we, we played our show to, to nobody. And he came out of the green room with a handful of songs left that we were playing. And after the gig, he was like, 
guys, that was really good. He was really into the music and uh, I think he went home and told a bunch of people about us and and then it just kind of spread like wildfire. All of a sudden we were getting played on KCRW and then, you know, Questlove talked about us and then Erica talked about us and then Prince talked about us and then it was just kind of over, you know, everyone, it was just blowing up all over the world. Wow. And, yeah, we just sort of rode the – rode that wagon for the, you know for the next six seven years <laughs> well but what was it what was it like in terms of um you know hearing people like prince endorsing your music was that did that mean a lot to you or did you was Are you serious <laughs> i mean you know i like some people are oh, more man. aloof than that you know some people i'm sure i mean look it, prince I complimented I think... dylan's music he'd be like oh, whatever <laughs> right 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 but if, if dylan wasn't famous then he he, he might think twice yeah that, yeah true know. but was I mean, it was it we just a weird time in the sense of things like all of us you know one minute you're playing a gig like five people and then the next minute it's like really blo- i mean prince compliment compliments or complimented no one you know more or less well like, I, he was I guess reclusive. you know there, there was shit happening every day you know like every day we wake up and there'd be some new news about you know something that someone that had heard us or, or something happening for the band so it was and that that went on that went on for quite a while so it just sort of just you know I mean, the Prince thing was crazy, dude. That's insane. I mean, we, we never actually got to meet him, which sucks. But we, we, we had invites to go to Paisley Palace a couple of times. But we just couldn't make it because we were on, in the middle of the tour. Wow. Um, so that, 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 I mean, we all regret that a lot because yeah. it would, would have been outstanding. He, he, he came and saw a gig that we did at his hometown and sat up in the back corner on the, like up in the stalls and couldn't see him. He was in the shadows and, and uh, apparently as the story goes, he, he, when I set up, I, I normally set up right of stage facing into stage. So my back is again, you know, if, if you can walk up onto the stage, my back's against the stage, like that, that walkway. Right. So apparently about an hour into the set, he came down, stood side of stage right behind me, like kind of danced a little bit and then just left my god and that was it he just ghosted us and and <laughs> so that's the closest i ever got to meeting meeting prince but i don't know like all all the accolades are, are great but it just sort of drives you to keep making the music that we make and keep on that that trip you know it's the oh, yeah. most important thing it's just yeah. to keep creating yeah for sure I, I mean you 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 guys obviously were touring and like building on um on that initial success but when it came to make choose your weapon was it was that a different like how different was that process um well it was a little bit different because we've been playing a lot of the music that on, on choose while we were touring so there was there was a lot of repertoire that we had up our sleeves that we already really knew how it should sound so that, that kind of changes the way you make a record, you know, whereas Talk Tomahawk was all completely fresh. There wasn't much stuff that we had a chance to really marinate on. Um, whereas Choose, there was years, years of us playing the music live to, and then when we came to tracking it, we just kind of did it. I mean, it was a really difficult process and it was a long, painstaking um, record to make because it was a big record, but... Um, I think there was a lot of rep on there that that was ready to go onto a record. Um, whereas this latest record, we 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 had one or two songs that we had already been playing for a number of years, but the majority of it is really fresh, and a, a lot of it happened in the studio, whether it be jams or written in the studio, or you know there was there was a that's yeah. It's about it. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, in, you're, are you now talking about Mood Valiant, like uh, which is coming out right. in, coming out this month? When when is it out? I think it's the twenty uh, fifth, isn't June. it? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So so was this was this started uh, pre coronavirus and lockdowns, or was this done? Yeah, we've been, the last couple we've been, of years. We've been tracking it for the last couple of years. Yeah. 
and whenever and, we haven't been on the road, we'll we'll jump in the studio and do a session. Yeah. Is that is that the main reason why you take? Um, I mean, it's not like you take your time in a traditional sense, but I mean, I guess there's a lot of there's a more like I don't know disposable like quick attitude to making music these days. But you guys leave a gap between your albums and do it in a kind of more traditional way. Is that because you want to put some thought into it and make it really good? Or is that because you're so busy touring? Fuck, man, it doesn't feel like a long time to me. Like, you go six years, and you're like, fuck, it has been six years. That's crazy. <laughs> um, but it does not feel like six years to me. I'm like, it was, you know, it's just, it's nonstop. When, when you're in a band that's it's, um, full time and everyone's doing other projects too. So with, within that time, everyone in the band has made several records you know, outside yeah. of hiatus. And yeah. so that, 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 that stuff's important as well. But um, it's, it's, you know, you got four musicians that you're trying to get into a room. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult to even just accomplish that. And then to have a really good session where you're making good music is, is another thing, you know? So it's, again, you, we, we don't need to rush it. I don't think any, any, any of us felt like we needed to rush it. The only ones that wanted it to be rushed are, management or anyone that's dealing with this outside of the band mm. that's uh, working with us yeah. but uh i i guess it's you know it, it just kind of evolved it, i mean covid really helped to finish it. it it sort of locked us down and we were able to go cool okay let's let's finish this record off so that that, that was a, kind of a big help for us to be able to just be in the same space and 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 finish it really and in terms of how this album differs from from the last yeah. two, uh, do you, do you all just you know contribute and and try and you know make the best record that you can without any kind of preconceived idea for what the album's going to be, or do you set out with a you know this is going to be the concept for this album and and, and we're going to build it around that? Uh, I think you know the, having. <sighs> That's that's a difficult question, dude. It's like, <laughs> you know, a, a a concept is is one thing. I I I think we we set out with a really rough plan of the songs that we could put on this record, but then it just kind of, you know, went from there. There was there was one or two songs that Nay brought in that we recorded at a studio, but we 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 went we went to a studio for a week and stayed there and just had you know and just recorded stuff so we we'd go out there we'd do those two tracks and then we'd jam and then all of a sudden a bunch of other music would come out of that session and that that would be turned into you know sparkle tape breakup or and we go gentle or, you know a bunch of the songs that just kind of evolved out of the studio jams and then you know we went to brazil and we did a, we, we we watched arthur verica record the strings for forget some and then we just booked out the recording studio for the rest of the night because he kind of finished up early and we recorded red room and we recorded stone or lavender you know and they just kind of came out we didn't prepare for that it just kind of happened and there's wow. something to be to be thought about within that kind of spont spontaneity that that is um you know a really nice refreshing way to be creating music i think if you really think about it too much and become quite strict on what you're trying to achieve, then it, there, there can be a sense of staleness to it in a way. Whereas if you're really super spontaneous and it just sort of comes out, it, it, you, you can capture some stuff that you, you don't realise you can. No, you're absolutely uh, right. And so many talented people who come on the podcast do kind of say that, uh, and say about capturing the moment and, and the vibe. In terms of like when that's but it's, happening it's, it's all dependent on the song you know like it's what the song is yearning for so, so, sometimes it needs to be thought about for months and months and, and yeah or, or you know the mixing process just can be agonizing it can take a long long time to get to the final product or it can just be a night of tracking and then a quick mix and you're like it's done you know yeah it's 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 all dependent on the song but when, when it's these quick uh, quick things or spontaneous things you know, yeah. like how spontaneous is it in the sense of does someone know the, the structure of the song or is or are you kind of like just improvising everything 
that, that, you, that you're doing. Well, like, for instance, is just jamming. I guess Red Room was the quickest one. Like me and Nay were tracking Stone or Lavender and Bender was in the other room working on something that we could do next because we had the time, right? So it was like, oh, I'll, I'll come up with an idea. And he came up with Red Room. And that was the riff, you know, that he came up with. And then we just jumped in the studio and slowly it unfolded. And they wrote lyrics on the spot, and, which she doesn't normally do, which was, was good, you know, a good exercise for her. And out came that track. And it took us, I don't know, maybe an hour or two to, to come up with the final final result and it was a it was one it was i think i think it was the first take or second take that we did it just kind of came out everyone was like that was good it was good great done you know <laughs> whereas other songs i can't think of one off the top of my head maybe not on this record but other songs that we were going to put on this record that didn't make it onto this this record we, we tried three times you know? we we and then even that second time we track it we're like ah, it's just not exactly how it should be so you redo the process you know and in terms but, of being a band like how does how does the mixing process and all, all of that work does everybody have to sign off on on everything like i imagine like that side of being in a band is pretty it must be quite you know i'm asking yeah. why there's gaps and stuff between albums but like all of that stuff and you know as you say organizing people to get together like is that, is yeah, that man, a everyone, tricky part of being Everyone has to sign off. Everyone has to sign off, which is incredibly tricky. But, you know, like sometimes you just got to bite your tongue, I guess. You know, <laughs> that's what happens when you're in a democracy. And you just got to be like, yep, yeah, it's probably for the greater good if I keep my mouth shut right now. Or if you really, really want it, you fight for it. But it's, you know, there's, it's an interesting thing to think about. The, there's always going to be positives and negatives around, uh, you know, an autocratic or a democratic uh, way of running a band, you know, like, uh, I mean, look, fuck, look at James Brown, dude. Like, you know, <laughs> look at, look at that shit. You, you, you talk to many of those musicians that worked in his band and, they weren't having a good time a lot of the time, but look how many fucking records he did, you know, Jesus. It's like, <laughs> like, you know, it was a you know simple I mean? system. Like, simple was, system. You know, simple God, system. He got He's in charge and uh, is, you know, thoroughly unpleasant and harsh to <laughs> all of the band members. And as a result, everybody plays like incredibly well uh, and they're super efficient. Yeah, I mean, you've got a point. I'm not sure what, what we can glean out of that, though, because I think it'd be quite hard for most people to pull off behaving like James Brown these days. I think it's just, it's it's important to, to realise the, the difference between those types of um, pr protocols within, within running a project or running a band. There's like, there's definitely positives and there's definitely negatives to all of them. But it's 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 having that realization when you're in it that that you know this is I'm um, I'm in another band called the Putbacks that's that's a completely democratic project as well and um, you know it's it's a completely different environment when it comes to the way we write and the way we record and the way that the whole thing works it's just very very different and it's 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 interesting to have the comparison of the two where I've got hiatus which is one which is just done completely differently compared to the putbacks, you know, it's, I, I think I'm lucky to have that situation where I can sort of take this, take, take a step back and get a different perspective on how a, a band operates. That's really interesting. How, how would you say that it's different? Just the, 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 the way people, I mean, well, for, for starters, like the putback system is as, as successful as, as hiatus is. And, and so there, there's, there's definitely a, a difference there and, and, and the way that the, the, the people are invested in the projects as well is there's like, like the putbacks, everyone's parents, they've got kids, they've got day jobs, you know, there's like, there's a, it's, it's a different environment 
that it, it, it's it's not as stressful i guess i don't know it's hard to it's hard to put put a finger on why they're different i mean personalities as well everyone's got different personalities that they bring to the project i mean the 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 putbacks guys play in many many different bands too so there's it's it's just a bit more relaxed i think and in terms of uh you know n- nowadays um now the hiatus, you know, in particular, are established and successful. Like, what is the balance of time that you have and have as a band, but also, you know, individually uh, between, you know, doing stuff like this, podcasts or interviews and promo and answering emails and doing admin and doing anything that's not, you know, what's the balance between that and then like actually playing music and creating music? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's it's tough dude it's, it's it's a really tough balance like especially right now with an album launch it's like there's a lot of media there's a lot of business but that's this is something that i definitely try and keep track of where it's very easy to just not play music as much as you probably should it's it's easy to get swamped with the business side of things and it's something that I think out of all of the band members, I probably think about the most in the sense of the business and the way that it operates and the finances and just, you know, we're, we're a company that's employing tens of, you know, people all over the world. And it's just, there's, there's some kind of, um, there's some kind of responsibility that comes with that. You know? And, and it's interesting when you, when you mm. there's, 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 there's not many like businesses. I can't think of many other industries where you have a business where the members of or the owners of the business didn't really want to start the business. <laughs> they just wanted to play music, man. We just got together. We started playing tunes. We had a great time. It gets takes off and then you got a manager and then you got a label and then all of a sudden bam you got a company and it's like ah where did that come from you know like it's it's very interesting i'm, I'm sure there was there have been many bands that have been taken advantage of because of that mere fact because they oh, yeah. didn't realize that they were what they were actually doing yeah, I mean, every band, more like, it's not an exaggeration to say that most kind of famous bands, like when there's a documentary or a book about them or whatever, there's always a chapter where it's like they realise that they've got no money left because the manager yeah. has, you know, is on board a private plane doing coke off <laughs> hooker's bum, <laughs> like spending their last precious dimes on it. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a terrible thing that seems to affect everybody, but it sounds sounds like it seems like today people are a bit more switched on. I mean, particularly with regards to the whole streaming uh, environment, um, people having yeah. to keep track there's, of, there's, of that. Yeah, totally, I I think there's something in that though. Like, you know, like a true. Uh, I don't want to say a true artist, but like there's, there's something about being a hundred percent creative and, and, and just having that mind frame where you, you, you're not business minded and, and, and you're not involved in that world. And as soon as you do get involved in that world, it kind of, you know, stunts your, your creativity in a way. Like Mm -hmm. if it, like the perfect balance for me would be like 95% music, 5% business, you know, like that, that would be ideal where I could just be all the time on it. Then one morning a week I have a coffee and I do my emails and that's it, you know, but it just can't be like that. You've, you've got to run a business. It's, it's, uh, you know, unless you've got complete utter faith in your management, which I do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 yeah. It seems that 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 it's it's the way that everybody wants to have more time doing the music uh, side of things, than, and and there is an obligation to to do the rest. And it's interesting and it's important as well for people listening who are trying to get into the industry or you know are aspiring musicians, and I guess maybe to realise that that dream of just doing 
music all the time is quite difficult if you want to get out there and put food on the table and and, yeah. uh, and, and make the business side of it uh, tick. Well, Simon, thank you so much for coming on the Greatest Music of All Time podcast. It's been awesome talking to you and I'm really looking forward to Rose Valiant coming out. Uh, and uh, a final question, you know, if off the top of the, your head you have to name three artists uh, for greatest artists of all time, who would they be in terms of who mean a lot to you? Who mean a lot to me? Um, greatest artists would be uh, Herbie Hancock, uh, 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 Jeff Buckley, uh, and... Um, uh, Apex Twin. There you go. There's three very different artists. Do you sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night? I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalize your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridland YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page. Who mean a lot to you? Who mean a lot to me? Um, greatest artists would be uh, Herbie Hancock, uh, 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 Jeff Buckley, uh, and um, uh, Apex Twin. There you go. There's three very different artists. Oh, well, they're, yeah, they're all, they're all amazing. And yeah, thank you, because it's always just a snapshot. Thanks so much, Simon. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, have a no good one. No worries, brother. Peace. Take care. Bye.